Listen guys, here's the thing. I'm old. I have gray hairs. But there's one thing that's been in my life since my hair was short and full of color. And that's video games. But recently, I've realized that I spend a lot more time consuming content about video games than I do actually playing video games. In fact, in the past couple of years, there's been months at a time where I did not play a single minute of video games. And it most certainly is not because I'm a busy and accomplished adult with a roaring career and social life, because <laughs> quite the opposite. My life mostly revolves around watching YouTube videos, streams, and shows, but I actively miss playing video games and spending countless hours immersing myself in creative worlds and game systems. And it seems like I'm the only one with this problem. All of my friends still have the games that they're obsessed with and play all the time. I personally don't enjoy most of those games since uh, apparently I'm a boomer that hates games now. So what's the deal? Am I growing out of this hobby that I've loved for so long? Or perhaps I'm just jaded from the infestation of corporate greed and its insatiable hunger for infinite growth afflicted upon us at every corner in every game with cash shops and battle passes, so many battle passes and coins and the crystals you have to buy and the crystals, you don't get the right amount of crystals and it doesn't make sense for all the items in the shop because they have, you have a little left over because they want you to spend more money. Or maybe games are just bad now. Or is it some other nuanced collection of reasons that I'm going to spend the rest of this video exploring and talking about? Yeah, no, games are definitely just bad now. It was the early 90s. One of my earliest, most vivid memories of video games was the Christmas that I got a Super Nintendo. I got this Mickey Mouse game called The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse. I remember just laying down in my living room for hours playing on my little CRT TV. It was like cracked, my tiny little underdeveloped brain just seeing pixels moving at my command. I was hooked and that was it. The floodgates were open, throwing Foot Clan ninjas into the screen in Turtles of Time, collecting all the letters in Donkey Kong Country. Stomping Koopas. In Super Mario World. Solving puzzles with all the cool items and the link to the past. That kick-ass intro in Super Metroid. I was hyped and stressed out of my little mind for that. This era was peak gaming and would forever solidify me as a Nintendo fanboy. But then, a few years later, the most fateful day of any kid growing up in the mid-90s. The Christmas where I got my... It was that sick-ass green one that was bundled with Donkey Kong 64 and that little RAM pack. But now, games were 3D. Donkey Kong, Mario, Zelda all had an entirely new dimension to explore, opening up so many gameplay options. But that wasn't all, because you could play with four players. Mario Kart, Mario Party, Smash Bros, the rise of party games. You could sit on the couch with your friends, smacking controllers out of each other's hands, accuse them of cheating, ruin friendships. It was great. But party games weren't the only thing that benefited from the four controller slots. Multiplayer first person shooters. My friends and I spent countless hours on GoldenEye 64. We even used to get cardboard boxes and tape them up to the screen to section it off so that you couldn't screen look. We took that shit very seriously. Now, by this time, first person shooters already existed on PC, but I had the crappiest Dell that was cheap and out of date even for the late 90s. Though I was still able to play bangers like Roller Coaster Tycoon, Age of Empires 2, Starcraft, I knew the PC was eventually going to be where it's at for me. But for now, the next console era was upon us. I really feel like there was two games in particular that defined this generation for me personally. The first game was Smash Bros. There were so many more characters than the first game, so many more stages, it controlled beautifully. It was a masterpiece. One time my parents made us go play outside and so we stuck the TV up against the window and threw the controllers out there and so we were all just standing outside playing Smash Bros through a window. And the second game was Time Splitters 2. From the same developers of GoldenEye, Time Splitters would become my favorite shooter to this day. The game had an insane amount of game modes, tons of characters, a map editor that you make your own story missions. It had it all. One of my friends was a genius when it came to making maps, and every time we got together, he had a couple new maps that had some interesting gimmick that completely changed the way we played the game. One of my favorite maps of his was one where it was just this square. It was like a grid of rooms with doors. 
and we would run around with one shot, one kill baseball bats. It was terrifying. If you've never played Time Splitters, uh, I'm sorry, you, you're really missing out. The era of couch gaming would not last forever though, and in fact, it was soon coming to a close. Monday, March 15th, 2004. This was the day that I created my first RuneScape account. It would be my first introduction into the world of MMOs, the genre that encapsulated everything that I loved about gaming. The adventure, the immersion, puzzle solving, crafting, and I could play and enjoy it with my friends and hundreds of people across the world. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was loving every minute of it. Later that year, a certain other MMO would release World of Warcraft. Unfortunately, there was one issue. I still had dial-up internet. It would be a few years until I got out of dial-up hell, so in the meantime, the only way I could play World of Warcraft was either by playing at friends' house or sneaking the installation out of the school computers in the library, which I absolutely did. They were not very well managed at the time. I wouldn't hit max level on World of Warcraft until the tail end of Burning Crusade just before Wrath. But by then, World of Warcraft was the game that I played, and it would remain that way for several years until about halfway through my senior year of high school. That's when I got beta access to StarCraft II Wings of Liberty. My friends and I were so hyped for this game, we spent every day in school in our computer class just playing StarCraft II. I fell in love with competitive gaming and esports because of StarCraft II. It was the first game that I actually tried to play competitively and work my way up a ranked ladder. I would practice almost every day with friends, watch Day 9 and Husky videos, aspirations of going pro. I only ever made it to plat, but getting to plat felt incredible. I remember my friend and I used to wake up at like 5 in the morning to watch the GSL. And in 2011, as a broke college student in Orlando, Florida, I bought a ticket to MLG using a literal bag of coins. But it was such an incredible experience. My friends and I got to meet all of our favorite players, Huck, In Control. We also got to meet Day9, Husky, Artosis, and Tasteless. It would be my very first, and unfortunately, my very last live gaming event. And eventually StarCraft II would give way to League of Legends, which a few years later gave way to Smite, which would be the last competitive esport game that I played seriously. None of them really grabbed me in the same way that StarCraft II did, and I'm not sure any other competitive esport ever will. This was about the peak of gaming in my life. The best of it all came before, and I feel like I can pinpoint the exact year that the steep slope downward began. And that year was 2014. This was the year that StarCraft was all but dead. The year Warlords of Draenor came out, the first ever World of Warcraft expansion that I did not buy or play. This was the year Destiny released and was a massive disappointment. This was the year that Smite introduced loot boxes. This was the year that Wildstar released and failed. And every year on from this point just seemed to be one big disappointment after another. It felt more and more common for games to release unfinished or broken or have some predatory monetization. Every year seemed worse than the last. Gaming seemed different now. The gaming industry has grown incredibly fast since I first picked up a controller. In fact, in 2021, the games industry raked in more cash than music and film combined. A good bit of this growth can be attributed to the rise of mobile gaming, which in 2021 made up 45% of the total revenue in the industry. And of course, the stench of this heaping pile of cash would not go unnoticed by the insectoid swarm of C-suite executives, and with their grubby little shit-stained appendages and their dunkest touch, they've pushed hard to make console and PC gaming monetization more closely resemble that of a mobile game, attempting to normalize all the same underhanded tactics which apply psychological manipulation in various ways to pry as much money as they can out of its users in a predatory manner. Whether it's feeding off of players' addictions by implementing gambling-adjacent mechanics, or their frustration by creating problems and selling back the solutions, or FOMO with limited time, buy now expensive skins. The online nature of the live service model has primed games for these sort of exploitations. It's not completely without its pushback though, as we gamers have been successful in combating some of these changes, as is the case with loot boxes, as we've pretty much eradicated those from most PC and console games at this point. 
though it definitely seems like a losing battle as every year more ground gives way to the normalization of such strategies in like a one step forward, 10 step back kind of way. For example, if we look back, it wasn't that long ago when DLC was considered outrageous. It was seen as devs taking content out of the original game and holding it back to sell later. But as always, the ground gave way and the conversation shifted to whether or not it was day one DLC or how much effort they put into the DLC, if the content was worth it. Fast forward to today where similar conversations are being had about the pay to win debate, where at first any pay to win is completely unacceptable, to now being able to find conversations about how a certain game is not that pay to win. But complaining about monetization in games is nothing new or original, in fact it's an oversaturated market and at this point just feels like beating a dead horse. It seems you'll never get enough people to care about this topic, and until that happens, nothing will change. Instead, I'd like to talk about a bit of a hot take here, that in the past 10 years, gaming really hasn't changed much at all. The gaming industry feels pretty stagnant. If I compare games as they are now to how I thought they would be by now as a kid, the picture is very disappointing. As a kid who just discovered MMOs like RuneScape and World of Warcraft, I was blown away by the idea of what MMOs could be in the future. I would hop off World of Warcraft and go play Dungeons and Dragons and think, man, one day World of Warcraft is going to have the same level of choice and consequence that I can have with my imagination playing D&D. Now obviously that hasn't happened yet, and as a kid I didn't know anything about game development. But I've heard a similar observation from Rasboon in his video series Gaming for a Non-Gamer, which is a great series and I recommend you check it out, where he discusses his wife's disappointment discovering video games for the first time. Her expectations for what she thought she could do in each game were always different than the reality, and I think as she realized that games were more simple than she had first assumed, some of the intrigue about them faded. There's a massive lack of innovation and risk taking in the AAA space, as we see games like Skyrim being released a billion times, The Last of Us is getting its third version of the game, Call of Duty ran out of ideas and decided to just loop back around and start re-releasing their games in order again, hoping nobody would notice, but they somehow made all the games worse so everyone noticed. Which brings me to my next point, where not only are companies not really interested in innovating at all, but they seem to be actively taking steps backwards in innovation. If you look at something like the original Fallout's super in-depth dialogue system versus Fallout 4's dialogue system, it's a huge step back. And that's a tame example. It gets so much worse. Blizzard, for example, figured out that they can retroactively ruin a 20-year-old game with Warcraft 3 Reforged. Well, I guess that was pretty innovative. The only real innovations coming out of this industry are coming from indie developers and modders, the latter of which is responsible for the two biggest genres in the past decade, and that's without even the expectation of getting paid. Isn't that weird? Kind of goes against the conventional capitalist thinking, huh? Looking at the trajectory of the industry, it's really hard to not just be depressed about it all and wonder if the industry can ever course correct. It's weird to think that things like YouTube, Reddit, and all these other social media sites haven't really been around that long. And yet it's sometimes hard to remember what it was like before they existed. These sites have made data mining, crowdsourced information, and video guides all accessible to everyone at all times. In some cases, the internet will have every bit of information about every mechanic and secret in a given game before they even release. And all of these things have drastically changed how we play video games. Let's take a look at a game like World of Warcraft. If I had to describe how I feel playing Retail WoW in one word, it would be emptiness. Not because of a lack of content necessarily, so much as the game just kind of feels soulless. Where before, the game was about adventure and discovery, it is instead now a game about optimization. It's essentially a solved game where add-ons and logs have optimized gameplay to a T with little room for experimentation or creativity. Which is fine, I mean no one likes to play suboptimally. I'm not trying to vilify optimization, as it can be quite fun for some people. Take speedrunning for example. Speedrunning is such an interesting hobby to me, it's something I've always wanted to get into but I've always felt a little intimidated by. The stuff that people are able to achieve with speedrunning is truly mind-blowing, some of which is only really possible because of the interconnected nature of modern gaming, where sharing glitches and exploits is part of the fun of collectively iterating on runs to shave off more and more time. But then if you look at something like RuneScape, one of the most solved games that has become literally all about the optimization, you'll find a community who's made it a tradition of coming up with off-the-wall challenges and restrictions inflicted upon their accounts, also known as snowflake accounts so that they are forced to forge their own path. 
There's no guide to follow on how to clear one of the hardest raids in old school RuneScape if you're not allowed to leave the swamp zone. But one man, after three years of theory crafting, grinding, and 33 very entertaining YouTube videos, was able to accomplish that goal, with hundreds and thousands of people watching and loving it. So clearly, the problem for World of Warcraft isn't just optimization itself. It's that optimization isn't just confined to the few who enjoy it, but instead sort of forced onto everyone else. With all these tools available to everyone and things like Raider.io assigning public completion scores, everyone is expected to be fully optimized or not play the game. Because again, no one likes to play suboptimally. Ignorance truly is bliss. It's my opinion that this is the real reason why World of Warcraft has been struggling. Like Asmongold has said, Blizzard has ignored the casual audience and failed to produce fun and compelling activities that aren't just about the optimization. Instead, they just continue to double down on the raids and dungeons catering to this nature of gameplay. Now, as of this recording, Dragonflight has not released yet, so maybe that will be the expansion that fixes this issue. But it's not just retail. A lot of players were excited about Classic and logged in expecting to recapture that nostalgic sense of adventure. But things are too different now. The way we play games is too different now. The game didn't seem nearly as hard as they remembered. The world not as vast. But I think it comes down to the fact that every facet of the game has been solved already, and that the joy of the original release lied in the discovery and the journey. Now, this is not everyone's opinion. There's still plenty of people that very much enjoyed Classic. This is mostly just anecdotal sentiment from me and my friends. But I do think that this might be why so many people get excited whenever a new MMO is released. It's a chance to discover things for the first time, to not be beholden to the methods and builds that someone else already figured out and everyone is expected to use. A chance for you to be the one that discovers those methods. But for better or for worse, this is just the way the world is now. Maybe someday a game will come out that is immune to this phenomenon. A game that can't be solved, where the discovery never goes away. It doesn't seem possible, but who knows? Maybe someday. I don't feel like a different person. I feel like I always have been and always will be me. But I've changed my mind and opinions on a lot of things in the past 10 years. Growing up and dealing with adult responsibilities can be really stressful. You're faced with a lot of change and uncertainty and it can be really easy to succumb to worry and regret. But worry and regret are just a waste of time. Time that could be better spent having fun. You know, people say video games are a waste of time, but personally, I think that having fun and enjoying your life is the best way to spend your time. But what do you do if you no longer enjoy your favorite hobby? With this fog hanging over my head, I began reminiscing on how I used to enjoy games. I used to spend countless hours grinding the ladder in StarCraft 2, working on refining builds, seeing small improvements over time, making quantifiable progress in the skill feel so good. Ah, the dopamine. But today, if you asked me to play just about any competitive game, I could not be fucking bothered. I haven't played League of Legends in like nine years, but I booted it up a couple of months ago. My friends were telling me about all the new champions and the new metas and the new builds and I just wanted to go take a nap. Is it because my attention span is shot? Is it the lack of elasticity in my rotting brain protesting against me trying to shove even more useless shit into it? Maybe both. I used to have the drive to spend hours learning everything I could about a new game. There were times where all I could think about was whatever game I was currently playing, thinking about what I wanted to accomplish next, how I was going to do it, and I wouldn't stop until I finished. Nowadays, I'd be lucky to stick with the game for more than a couple weeks before I'm over it, regardless of if I actually finished it or not. So then, are there any games that I do enjoy? After so many disappointing letdowns and trying to enjoy games that just start to annoy me after two weeks, this question legitimately crossed my mind. And at the peak of my jadedness, one game proved to me that I did still indeed have the capacity to fall in love with the game. And that game was Valheim. A game that isn't even finished yet, but a game that so perfectly created a sense of adventure and discovery that it reminded me why I love gaming to begin with. So it seems there may still be remnants of a gamer deep underneath all the jadedness I've proven to myself that I definitely haven't outgrown the hobby. Maybe I've just been playing the wrong games. And sure, the world is different, and the way we play games is different, 
but they're still fun to be had. And despite the industry's best efforts to cannibalize itself, there will always be passionate indie developers and modders to pick up the slack and make good games and experiences. And maybe that's enough. Well, it kind of has to be enough. But I'm determined to rekindle my love of gaming. And that will be my New Year's resolution. I will begin my search to find the fun.